So let's take a look at this. So here I've plotted for you the time evolution of being in the excited state after the system was initialized in the ground state as a function of time. And you see, rather than getting more and more atoms in the excited state, we start out with nothing in the excited state. Then this grows, and it grows initially quadratically, like t squared. And this is something, of course, which, is, which we know. That's exactly the result we got from perturbation theory. So for short times, we recover the perturbation theory result of our system. But for longer times, you see something dramatically different is happening. So the excited state population does not grow anymore. It actually saturates everything is excited in the excited state. And then I transfer the atom back to the ground state. So now this kind of excited state amplitude is decreasing as a function of time. Then everything is back in the ground state again. And then I excite the atom back to the excited state, back to the ground state, back to the excited state. And all of this happening at the oscillation frequency of the light field. So actually we see a very, very strong nonlinear response of our atom. So as a function of time, I don't get more and more uh, population in the excited state, but I get these very strong uh, nonlinear response in form of these oscillations between the ground state and the excited state. So when do I go back to the ground state? Well, we can just turn back to our equations on the last slide, and we find this is the case for 2 pi over the resonant Rabi frequency. Uh, I go to the excited state for pi divided by omega 0 in my system. Then I go back to the excited state again at 3 pi over omega 0 and back to the ground state again at 4 pi divided by omega 0 in my problem. So now let's pause for a second and think, how does the ground state population evolve as a function of time? Think for yourself for a moment, if I would plot the ground state population as a function of time, what would that actually look like? Did you get it right? Well, let's take a look. How would that look? So initially, we start out with everything being in the, excited, in the ground state. So I have to start up here with my ground state population. And then, as time evolves, this is going to go down, up, down, up, complementary to my kind of excited state evolution, because I know, I know that the sum of being in the ground state plus the probability of being in the excited state, this always has to add up to 1. Huh? So I have to be somewhere in my system. This always has to add up to 1, meaning that whenever everything is in the ground state uh, here, there's no population in the excited state. And when everything's in the excited state, nothing's the ground state. And kind of um, for the other times, we get the corresponding results of the system. So we have two complementary kind of outputs that we can get if we look for the probability of being in the ground state or the excited state of the system. Now, just to give you the complete solutions also for the case of detuning, with detuning, I'm not going to solve these differential equations, which is a little bit cumbersome. I'm just going to show you the results. So if you have detuning and you start with an atom in the ground state, with detuning, you actually also find that the system exhibits Rabi oscillations. Uh, it also oscillates, but it oscillates with a smaller amplitude. So it oscillates between the ground state and a little bit excited state, ground state, a little bit excited state, and so forth. So it oscillates here. But with an amplitude which is much reduced compared to the resonant case, it's reduced by this factor omega 0 squared divided by omega squared. And omega here, this is just the square root of the resonant Rabi frequency squared plus the detuning squared. So this is what we call the effective Rabi frequency of the problem. So this is the effective Rabi frequency of the problem. So we see that the system oscillates faster, but with less amplitude. But it always comes back to the ground state again, but doesn't quite make it up to having everything fully excited in the excited state com in comparison to the resonant case here with delta equals to zero. So this is the solution for the case with detuning, and you could derive that uh, 
by just going back to our original differential equations with detuning and solving these. So, finally, for the course for this uh, lecture today, let me just look at a few special cases that we can think of. So, we could start in the ground state. Let's say we always start in the ground state, initially amplitude being uh, in the ground state, so C1 of 0 being 1. And then, for example, we apply a light atom interaction for a time omega 0 times tau equal to pi. Okay, plug this into our oscillating solutions and you find what's going to happen that this initial state vector 1, everything being state 1, is just going to go to I2. And 2 is going to go to I1. So basically you swap the population between the ground state and the excited state. You can start with the system in a ground state. You apply a light pulse for a time tau equals to pi over omega zero and afterwards you're going to have all the population in the excited state. And likewise if you start in state two and you apply this kind of pi pulse you end up with all the population of the atom being in the ground state again. There's another special case, the so-called two pi pulse we want to look at where we saw that we would actually come back to the original ground state after uh, omega zero times tau equal to two pi. Well, that's not quite right. We actually see that after a two pi pulse here, we come back to minus the ground state. And you might say, okay, this minus factor, does this really play a role? And we're actually going to see in some experiments that we'll discuss later on that this minus factor can make a huge difference. Only when you make a 4 pi rotation, when you make another 2 pi pulse, you come back to the original state. So you have a 2 pi pulse here, you go to minus 1, you apply another 2 pi pulse, you go back to the state 1. And this is something that you might have encountered already for the spin 1 half system, that for the spin 1 half system to come back to the original state, you have to uh, make it undergo a 4 pi rotation due to the SU2 symmetry of the problem. So this is the same here for our two-level system, which maps exactly onto the spin one-half problem. It's exactly the same problem that we have in front of us. So um, one goes to minus one and two goes to minus two. And that means that any state vector, which we can write as alpha one plus beta two, if I apply such a two pi pulse, state 1 is just going to go to minus 1, state 2 is going to go to minus 2, is just going to be minus alpha 1 minus beta 2, and that's just minus the original state, minus 1 alpha plus beta 2. So the original state is just gone to minus the original state that I had under the action of such a 2 pi pulse. Now let's finally discuss the case of a pi over 2 pulse, so when omega times tau is pi over 2, let's say we start in the ground state, we apply the pi over 2 pulse, and just looking at how our state amplitudes evolve, what I'm going to find then is that after this pi over 2 pulse, I have a superposition state, 1 over square root 2 of 1 plus i2. So after a pi over 2 pulse, I've brought the atom into a coherent superposition of the ground and the excited state. So keep that in mind that with the pi pulse, we can swap the populations. With a pi over 2 pulse, we can bring the system into a superposition state of 1 and 2. And with the 2 pi pulse, we can actually flip the sign of the state from plus to minus. We're going to make use of all of these kind of special cases uh, as we go through the course. And these are kind of things you should remember. All right, that's everything for today. I wanted to tell you about the two-level atom. Uh, so I um, hope you understood the dynamics and the difference of the dynamics compared to the perturbation result that we had in the previous lectures. This dramatic kind of nonlinear response of the atom that we encountered, that we can have the atom oscillate between the ground and excited state at the Rabi frequency. That's the main result of this lecture. Rather than increasing population, we go to the excited state, back to the ground state, back to the excited state, back to the ground state.
And that's something we cannot get from the classical physics result. This is really something we can only have for the quantized atom that we're discussing here. All right, thanks a lot for watching today and I'll see you in the next class.